In today's video, part two of our discussion on corporate giving software solutions, we talk about implementation and how to do it for your business. Let's make a social impact. Hi everyone, welcome to the Social Impact Show where CSR professionals get the latest strategies and tips to help develop and grow their CSR and goodness programs. Now remember, if this is your first time on this channel and you wanna get the latest strategies from the experts, hit the subscription button below, hit the little notification bell so you're up to date with everything. So today I'm joined by Catherine Pisco, Goodness Catalyst with Benevity. And this is part two of our discussion on corporate giving software solutions. And we're going to talk about implementation. So Catherine, what, let's say, you know, in our previous video, we talked about what it is, you know, and how to get it. So let's say we've got this software. What's actually the first step? Like, hey, you know what? Executives have paid, we know we've got the um, internal buy-in, everything's set. We now have the software. What, what is the next step? Yeah, that's a great question. So next step is to actually implement, physically implement the technology within the company. So you are essentially um, spend several weeks, at least at Benevity with our team, it typically takes about 12 weeks to implement the software. And it's because we want to understand exactly what your current program looks like, what the goals of your program are, what you're measuring, and then figure out how does our technology best support you in that. And so we typically break it down into several different stages or steps. And what's really important is meeting with the multiple stakeholders in the program as well. So you certainly have the administrators, the CSR leaders who are kind of running the program, but you also have likely folks from your payroll team or IT potentially your HR team. There may be groups of ambassadors that also need to be looped into the conversation. So it's setting up uh, conversations with all of these teams in a more formal way. And then go, so we would call that like a project discovery, um, do some project planning. So figure out what makes the most sense in implementing this technology. Uh, product design, program design. So that's taking everything that you as a professional have told us about your program and really working on it together to figure out how to best leverage the technology. Then we configure, um, so project configuration. We look at um, actually getting it set up on the back end so that everything runs really smoothly once you've implemented. Then we do some testing. We set up a site where we're testing, making sure that it's looking good. And then typically when you're launch ready, we'll do some sort of soft launch where it's to maybe a smaller number of employees or in a more controlled environment. And then you actually launch it to the entire company or whoever your users um, that you have earmarked for it. Um, and so that's kind of the first step going through that whole implementation process before you can actually go live. And do you do it in stages? So like, let's say you've launched, um, do you launch, like, let's say you bought like a software tool. Let's, so let's ex take example, Benevity's tool then. Um, now in a previous video, in, in our previous video, we, we mentioned we pro some companies don't use every single feature, but let's say this company actually wanted to use every single feature. Do you launch with all the features all at once or do you say, you know what, let's launch with this feature first, this feature second, or your most important priority feature. And then as you get more accustomed to the tool, you start launching the other ones. Yeah, great question. You you kind of answered it on your own too, but yeah, we typically <laughs> recommend we typically recommend doing kind of a phased approach to implementation. So um, companies can have a variety of reasons for choosing to implement some things over others, and the, there's various different options. So at Benevity, for instance, we have multiple different product offerings. So we have an employee engagement product offering that covers everything from giving to volunteering. We have a granting solution. We also have an API solution and a, a nonprofit solution. And so we would, um, even if you were gonna take advantage of everything, um, we wouldn't necessarily say launching everything at once makes the most sense. And so some companies have a reason for needing to launch one over the other. Maybe you have a huge giving campaign that you need to run by a certain date and that comes first. So you're going to prioritize that. Or to your point earlier, uh, maybe one of the those 
products is a little bit more important to you. You need it up and running sooner. And so we prioritize that as well. And so basically we'd go through each of those phases of implementation for each product and launch at different times. And typically what we do is that'd be also part of our kind of scoping conversation in the very beginning is how do you want to time this? Let's uh, create kind of a work back plan, meaning, okay, if you want to launch on this date, it's going to take this much time. And these are the steps we need to take to get there um, and work backwards that way and then really map it out for the next year or next several months or whatever phases you decide as an organization to do. So how many people does it actually take to run like a, like this type of software, right? Like I know we talked about how it could be run by one person, but just the description of all the level, the different phases and stuff, what would be an optimal number of people to actually run? And then how many hours does it take a week to actually, you know, implement and actually truly maximize the use of, of, of uh, a CSR software? Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, the answer is it varies widely, um, really depending on the size and scope of your program and the capacity and budget that you have. It can be run by one person um, in terms of physically running the technology but you have to have buy-in and engagement from across multiple stakeholders. And I think I read a statistic that said, on average, it's between six and nine people at a company that are somehow engaged, whether or not they're actually running in the administrator of the program. So you have someone from payroll, someone from IT, um, and then your CSR folks as well. And that obviously varies widely depending on the company, how you're going to have it set up, and those, which stakeholders need to be involved. From a time perspective, that really varies as well. I mean, if you're talking also whether or not someone actually has technology to help, there's going to be much more time involved if you don't have technology, if you're just using Excel. Um, you know, we've heard time and time again from our clients how much time actually is cut off of working on their program when they implement technology. When Visa came on board, one administrator told us that she actually gets 75% less emails now from employees asking about their CSR program than before. And so if you have technology, you're able to spend a little bit less time, at least on the admin. Um, and then I think the last variable there is how many folks you actually have working on this. If you can spread the work amongst, you know, a, a large group, or as we've talked about in the past, if you have some sort of ambassador program where maybe you have one or two people that are actually running the CSR program, but you have ambassadors in every market or in several of the most engaged markets um, uh, within your company that are also doing some of that work as well. And so um, it really depends on, on how large and, 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 global the program is, but you can control some of the variables by thinking about how many people, what sort of technology and what your program actually looks like. So for people who've never like, you know, um, aren't used to implementing um, like a whole bunch of software and, and you just want to actually get the program running in your, in your organization, do you need highly technical people to actually use um, corporate giving software? Or is it really easy for, I guess, a lot of people to be trained on it because there are some times and you know I, I come from the digital marketing space where like you know people imp like hey you know this technology we hear all these great things about it let's implement it and the moment they implement it they're like I, I can't I don't know how to use this tool because I can't I don't even know how to use the features yeah no that's a great question and I think this varies depending on who you partner with from a technology perspective too I think one thing that everyone should think about before they make a purchase is how user-friendly the technology is, not only for the employees. Um, for instance, with Benevity, there's zero training that an end user, an employee from your company would need to be able to interact with, with the Benevity platform. And then also from the admin perspective, to your point, I mean, I can barely plug in my computer, Carl, and <laughs> I can use I can use uh, the Benevity technology. But you know, I think asking the questions on how much much training do you actually need? What sort of training is there as well? And that's why when we're, you know, we're talking all about implementation today, that's why implementation is so important too. It really gives you the playbook and the manual for how to use the technology, um, not only from a features and functionality, but also how to make the most of the technology there. So the moment, let's say the moment we've, you know, we've launched it, how do I grow the participation, right? How do I grow? I think that would be the the, the number one thing that a uh, CSR professional would be looking at is like, how do I grow participation of my uh, program 
but more specifically, how do I use, leverage, I guess, the technology to actually help grow that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, you know, again, depending on your program and what's important to your people, it, it might look a little bit different, <clears throat> but we have, we um, at Benevity actually launched something called the Corporate Purpose Playbook this past year, where we looked at trends across all of our, you know, Fortune 1000 clients as to what kind of aspects of these programs tend to lead to the most successful and most engaged programs. And engaging can, can be more than just giving dollars and having matching dollars in the platform. It can also be volunteering. It can be engaging in small acts of kindness. Um, but there was a couple of things that we saw across the most successful programs that I think might be relevant to mention. One is the most successful programs tend to be very personal. So they are programs that are really empowering the individual employees to give or to volunteer with um, nonprofits that are, are really important to them. People are much more likely to choose to give time and money if, if they're able to choose where that goes. The second is kind of making it easy. So having multiple options of ways to engage, not just giving, not just volunteering, but both. Um, but then also specific to the giving piece, implementing payroll. So when you look across our client community, people are 70% more likely to give if they have payroll enabled and they end up giving like four times more money because of that. It's much more easy to give if you can give via payroll. The other thing we see is really uniting kind of giving and volunteering. So um, we see that, you know, there's a certain level of participation um, that's there when companies offer giving only. I think it's like a 12% average participation. But when you add giving and matching, it pops up to 16%. And then when it's giving and volunteering, you're at 20%. And then when it's giving, volunteering, and matching, you're all the way up to 25%. And so you see that incremental growth in the more that you can offer. And so I think it's really thinking about not only empowering your employees' personal passions, but also giving them a, a multiple ways to engage because not everyone has time to volunteer. Not everyone has the money to give, but people do want to do something that make, you know, uh, make the world better and, and that makes them feel good about themselves. And remember, if you're getting value from this video, we'd appreciate you hitting that like button. And the question of the day for you is, how have you implemented your corporate giving software? Let us know in the comments section below. So Catherine, just one last question here in terms of implementation. When you're actually ready to launch, you probably want to launch, you know, with, you know, pretty big bang, I guess. How do you go about, um, like, what are some of your ideas in terms of maximizing, like employee engagement, when you're ready to launch? What are some of the ideas you can provide? Absolutely. And I think it's so important to think about this too, because think about what you've already been through, building the business case, convincing everyone to purchase this. Then you go through the whole implementation process and you only have one time to officially kind of launch this program to the company. And so we've seen a, a bunch of really creative strategies that have worked really well. Um, one is to, to launch around a time that's already really important um, to the company. So let's say you have an annual volunteer week that is really well attended and people love of launch this around them so then so that people get really excited. Uh, we've also seen it be really effective where you have leadership or even the CEO make an, a large announcement and show support for the program. Um, and then in terms of communicating, get really creative as to how you um, communicate about the program. You know, when back when we were in office, we would have, we had um, a client have all of their ambassadors wear a red shirt to the office to talk about, um, talk about the launch or um, creating a really great video to really kick it off. Um, but the number one way that we've really seen to really maximize engagement at launch is to actually seed the accounts of your employees. So if you picture in this technology, every employee has their own kind of personal page and they're, they each have, at least in the Benevity technology, a giving account that they're able to use, to give to nonprofits of their choice. What we've seen companies use really effectively is they'll actually seed each of these giving accounts with like, it could be $2, it can be $10, it can be $50 and say, hey, we have put money, it's basically free money into your account that you're able to then go and donate to any charity of your choice, but you have to go in the platform to use it. And one of our clients, Splunk, did this exact thing, had crazy success because they seeded everyone's account with $10, 
but they said that they seeded one employee, one lucky employee's account with $10,000. And so you had to go into the platform to see what that looked like. They ended up having 62% um, participation. And what they found is that people didn't just give the $10 in their giving account. They gave some of their own money as well. And so the campaign was wildly successful. And so it's really getting creative, um, centering it around a time that makes sense for your company and having that, um, that support and that communication all the way through. And I'm sure the, you know, how people actually launch programs now versus, you know, before the pandemic, like has changed. Have you, have you seen any of those differences? Absolutely. Um, because we're just are not in person anymore. And so some of the things that might have really effective or even, you know, going desk to desk to make reminders or having really cool launch events in person. Unfortunately, those things have gone away this past year, but we've seen a huge shift to virtual and the benefits of virtual is that it also tends to be much more inclusive. You know, you can actually involve the entire company in something like that. Whereas when, when you're in person, um, it might have a really great splash for everyone at, at the headquarters, but if you have multiple offices around the country and the world, it's more difficult to do it. So instead we've seen, you know, you, you could even launch things on a, on a Zoom meeting, you know, everyone has the same Zoom background or you're um, having a company-wide virtual meeting and you play a really inspiring video. Um, you know, no matter what it is, it's really just thinking about a way to build excitement uh, communicate with your employees in a way that's a little bit different than how they typically get communication and making it relevant for them with some incentives as to why they would want to do it. Perfect. Do you have anything else to add in terms of implementing a corporate giving software? No, other than just, I think, to, to really think critically as you're deciding on corporate giving software, um, to really understand what implementation looks like, um, and so that you know that you're partnering with, with someone in, a, in an organization that um, has your best interest in mind and has a plan in place, because it, it is challenging to, to implement, but once it's done well, it just sets you up for great success. And remember to watch part one of our discussion on corporate giving software solutions, where we talk about what it is in this video here. And check out this video for our part three of our discussion on how to actually leverage the software to improve employee engagement. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in our next episode.